you know, I have this observation about Christians. That, that sometimes their context, the situation which they find themselves in, affects their level of faith. You know, here on a Sunday morning, we're all here together. We've had a fantastic time of worship and prayer. We've heard about answers to prayer. We've had loads of people we've prayed for, seen some amazing things this morning. It's very easy to be positive about God this morning and God's activity in your life, isn't it? Isn't it? In this teaching, Pastor David, in conversation with the congregation of GBC, explores what it means for us, as part of God's household, to be heirs of God's promises, to draw on the riches of Christ, and to be a part of a tapestry that reveals to the whole cosmos something of what God is like. These are amazing, encouraging insights into God's purposes for us. Father God, thank you for your activity among us this morning. It's been an amazing morning as we've celebrated your love and your goodness. Thank you that your banner is over us and your banner is love. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the testimonies we've heard this morning. Thank you for all your goodness. So Father God, as we come now to look at your word, we ask for revelation. Father, you will open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears, as well as our physical eyes and ears, to hear from you this morning. Father God, help us to grasp something more this morning of your purposes for us as a church community here, for us as individuals as a part of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is uh, part three, uh, the final part, looking at our motto for this year, which is? That was almost loud enough, but not quite. I'm not sure the mic will have picked it up. So can we have another go? Fantastic. We have a new motto each year. We, the motto that we, we take as the leadership team choose uh, reflects something specific that we believe that God wants to challenge us about, to encourage us about. And we expect that each motto that we take each year will have an impact in the life of our church family here and beyond. And a few weeks ago, I began to unpack some of what we believe the significance of this motto is for us. We looked initially at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 18. And then last week, we looked at chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Who was here last week? Fantastic. That's good. So what were the key things we learned last week? That we're all bonded like bricks. Very good. Yes, there speaks somebody from the church premises management team. We're bonded together like bricks. Very good. What else are the key things from last week? Don't all rush at once. I'll come back. The closer you get to God is the closer you get to other people. Very good, because we use a bicycle wheel. It's not actually in the... uh, in the text we looked at, we use the illustration of a bicycle wheel. The closer you get to the hub, the closer you get to the other space. I saw a hand over here, but there. We are privileged, but at the same time, we have responsibilities as well. Mm-hmm. Great privileges, but also that comes with responsibilities. There's some other really important things, some really things I got very excited about last week that you haven't remembered yet. So let's keep going. Be in your God's family. Absolutely. We're members of God's family. Yeah. And we also are, we once were foreigners, but now we are citizens of God's kingdom. And we explored something of that last time. And we finished last time looking at another image that's there in the text. 
uh, that's about us corporately and about us individuals. We are also what? A holy sanctuary. We are a temple. We are the place. We're a living temple as a community together. We're a living temple where God's spirit dwells. And as individuals, when we leave here, we also are individual temples. So when you go, think where you're going to be tomorrow morning at 9.30. Can you just think where you're going to be tomorrow morning at 9.30? So at 9.30 tomorrow morning, you are going to be a temple for God's Holy Spirit. At 9.30 tomorrow morning. You'll also be at 9.31 and 9.29, but I'm just choosing, just choosing 9.30. So wherever you're going to be at that moment tomorrow morning is an opportunity for God's Spirit to work through you. Amen? Amen? Because God's Spirit will be there with you. You are the place. You are the place where heaven touches earth. And people around you can experience something of heaven as they talk to you tomorrow at 9.30 or any other time. Isn't that amazing? So we're going to continue picking up at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at the first 13 verses this morning. So Paul continues in his letter. He says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And then he stops. We'll come to the stop in a moment. For this reason links this passage we're going to look at this morning directly with the passage before that contains the motto for this year. For the sake of you Gentiles is a reference to the fact that it was opposition from the Jews, who you may remember from the first part, resented Paul's teaching that God accepted non-Jews without them becoming Jews. They became Christians, they're acceptable to God, they didn't need to become Jews as well. And it was that which had led to his imprisonment. Now, um, Paul was about to pray at what we now have as verse 2. But he got sidetracked into what the passage we're going to look at. Because if you look at verse 14, you'll find that Paul picks up again. For this reason, I... He doesn't bother repeating Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. He says, I kneel before the Father. So that's where he is going back to. Do you know, I have this observation about Christians. That, that sometimes their context, the situation which they find themselves in, affects their level of faith. You know, here on a Sunday morning, we're all here together. We've had a fantastic time of worship and prayer. We've heard about answers to prayer. We've had loads of people we've prayed for, seen some amazing things this morning. It's very easy to be positive about God this morning and God's activity in your life, isn't it? Isn't it? But if you're in a really difficult context, maybe it's not so easy. Here's the thing. Here's Paul. He actually is now a prisoner. And he's waiting for trial before Emperor Nero. And that trial could result in his execution. He's not going to leave with a 50 pound fine. Do you know what I mean? It's a very serious trial. And he recognized, here's the thing, he recognized that his imprisonment was a consequence of his serving Jesus. It wasn't that something had gone wrong. It wasn't that he'd made a mistake. It wasn't that he'd been a bad person and therefore he's awaiting trial. His trial was a direct consequence of the fact that he'd done what God asked him to do. And even though he was a prisoner awaiting trial 
on a charge that could lead to his execution, that doesn't in the slightest affect his view that God is in charge. You know, sometimes I get Christians say to me, they're having a hard time, and they say, I've been praying about this, where is God? Well, I'll tell you where he is, he's running the universe, and he's looking after your life right now. You might not be able to see it, you might not feel it, but that is the fact, that is the reality. And here is Paul in prison on trial for his life, and he hasn't got the slightest doubt that God is in sovereign charge. And that isn't because he believes that whatever the outcome is, he's going to be released. It's not that he's got some super optimistic view of life. It's very clear from his letters that's not the case. So it reminds us, I don't know how life is for you at the moment, but you may be experiencing some really difficult circumstances. You may be, whether you're here this morning or if you're watching this on the internet subsequently, you may be experiencing some really difficult circumstances in your life, in your situation. So take encouragement from this. God hasn't forgotten you. God is still in sovereign charge. God is still running the universe and if he's your Lord, he's in charge over your life as well. Whether it feels great or feels rubbish, the fact is, God is in charge. Amen? Amen. And that needs to be as much amen when it's difficult as when it's easy. And we're going to come back to that at the end of this teaching this morning. So that's his context. So verse 2 to 13 is like an aside. Just he sort of, he's about to pray. You know what some pastors are like, don't you? They're about to pray and they sort of, before I pray, let me, and they sort of, you get a, a mini sermon then they pray. Do you know any pastors like that? (laughs) Well, Paul's a good example. So before he goes into this prayer of verse 14, which we're not going to look at this morning, he says this, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, The mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. Now that phrase, administration of of God's grace, is a um, a bit clumsy English, I think. And not that I'm an expert in such things. But it really is about stewardship. Now if you're a steward, we we don't sort of have stewards so much today in uh, England as we used to have. A steward, um, Warren, be my, be my visual aid for a moment. This is Warren. So if Warren was my steward, I might give Warren, uh, say, Warren, would you look after my house for me? So that means that Warren has got charge of my house. He's able to buy things for it. He's able to do whatever needs doing to the house. He's got authority over the house, but it's not his house. It's still mine. He's my steward. Have you got that? But he's got a huge amount of authority. He, he, while he's my steward, he acts as though it's his house, but remembering that it's mine. With me? Thank you, you did that very well. (laughs) Paul is the steward, the administration, the steward of God's grace. Wow. We're going to unpack a bit more of what that means as we go through this morning. And, And that includes this mystery. Now, now the word mystery in English, we we don't have an equivalent English word to the the Greek word that is used here. So mystery is the nearest we've got. But but mystery in English implies something obscure or or something inexplicable, something that you you can't find out about. At the moment, we have in one of our main news stories, don't we, the mystery of this flight. That's how the word's used. But actually, in the New Testament, the word mystery has a very different meaning. It's connected, but different. It's used for something that God has revealed that human beings couldn't work out by themselves. 
So it's, it's what some writers call an open secret. It's something you can't know if God doesn't reveal it. So it's a mystery in that sense, but God has chosen to make it plain. It's an open secret. And in this context, it's this, verse 4. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight, because he's the steward, my insight into the mystery of Christ. So not the mystery, ooh, spooky, obscure, mystery God has revealed about Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. Do you remember we saw last week that the revelation to the apostles and prophets is the foundation on which our lives, the church life, is built? Remember we saw that last week? Okay, so it's back referred to here. So that revelation, not been revealed by the Spirit, or so it has been revealed by the Spirit now to God's holy apostles and prophets. The mystery is, ready for the excitement? The mystery is that through the gospel, the good news of Jesus, Gentiles, that's non-Jews, are heirs together with Israel. If you were a Jew reading this at the time Paul was writing it, by now you would be putting ashes on your head, tearing your clothes, and swearing to God for vengeance against Paul. That's how radical this statement is. Okay, this, is, this isn't just a casual comment here. This is massive. So the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body. Do you remember two times ago we talked about the dividing wall of hostility? We talked about how Jews saw Gentiles and how Gentiles saw Jews. Do you remember that? Now, together, one body and share us together in the promise in Christ Jesus. We're going to unpack some of the content of that a little bit later on this morning. Now, not made known to men in other generations, nowhere in the Old Testament does God reveal the radical nature of his intention to replace the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, as God's people. To replace them with an international church, with everyone on an equal basis. You're so familiar with this, you think, yeah, well, so what? But in those days, this was absolutely, breathtakingly radical. That's why Paul is in prison, because he, he believed this. So fused together into one new humanity, as also we explored in part one of the series. Now let's begin to dig into this a little bit deeper. So we've got this phrase here, joint heirs and sharers together in the promise of all that God has for them. Some of which they and we have begun to experience, but much of it for them and for us is in the future. And Paul's teaching here, and what I'm going to say now to you is controversial, so I just flag up that a lot of other Christians will not agree with this statement I'm going to make now, So, but I don't mind being controversial. Um, I'm too old to mind about being controversial these days. So this also implies that it is the church, it is us, that are the inheritors today of the promises made to God's people in the Old Testament. We are the inheritors of those promises. So let's have a, have a think for a moment. Let's try and begin to put some uh, flesh on these bones. Most of the rest of this morning we're going to be 
uh, unpacking and digging into these, these things. So let's make a start with that. I want you to think for a moment. You up for some thinking? I want you to think, and the answer is not in this passage. Okay. So you can read it back through by all means, but you won't find the answer there. Not in the verses we've read this morning. I want you to think of some of the things that you, if you're here this morning, raise your hand. Fantastic. You who are here this morning, I want you to think of some of the things that you have already received that are a part of what is promised to you as God's people, your inheritance in God, and some of the things that you know will be coming your way but you haven't received yet because some of them you don't get till after your physical life on this planet has finished. Do you understand the question? So I want you to think, cast your mind around of what you know. For some of the things that you have already received, in part or in total, that you are joint heirs of, that you are sharers together in the promise of, and some of the things that are going to be that are future for you now, but are promised to you. And when God promises, you receive. It's not like people when they say to you, yeah, I'll promise I'll, 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 I'll send you that tomorrow. The check will be in the post tomorrow. Yeah, I promise I'll do that. You know, when God promises something, it's as good as delivered. So let's spend a few minutes because this is really exciting, and if we don't actually put some of the flesh on these bones, we're not going to realize just how much stuff there is here. So, so you can talk about what you've already received, or what is promised, or what you've got a bit of and is still to come. So, any of that. Let's go. I expe- uh, hmm. How many of you here read the Bible? Fantastic. All of you who read the Bible actually ought to have an answer for this question, just like that. All right? So I actually expect a sea of, a sea of arms? Hands? No, not sea. It's a forest of arms. That's better, isn't it? A forest of arms, not a sea of arms. So, so okay, you were first, so I'm going to come to you anyway. Um, baptism, dying through, going under the water, and rising again, coming up. Okay, which signifies what? That's the beginning of? New life in Christ. Yeah. Eternal life. It's not... Pie in the sky when you die, it's steak on the plate while you wait. Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins, yes. The Holy Spirit. Amazing. You, if you want to find out more about what that means, Steve, we've got a theological evening in a couple of weeks' time exploring about the Holy Spirit and what having the Holy Spirit means because we believe that a lot of people don't get it. They think that the Holy Spirit is just like some force like electricity you know, that we have. But actually, there's a, so that's a really good answer. I'd come to that evening if I were you as well. Um, forgiveness of, of sins through um, the shedding of blood. It's the Jews, uh, the Bible says, without blood, um, there's no forgiveness. And the Jews, they made animal sacrifices. And now, for me, Jesus is the Lamb of God and his blood's for me, which wasn't available to non-Jews before. Fantastic. Forgiveness of sins. I see that hand. I just to be careful going past that speaker or else I'm going to get feedback and I'll be in so much trouble. Okay, the book of Joel, chapter 2. I'm trying to read this without my glasses. It says, After this I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams and your young men will see visions. I will even pour out my spirit on the male, males and females, even slaves. In those days I will display wonders. Fantastic. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Carefully going past the speaker. Where's this forest of hands? Come on. Freedom from sin. Amen. He will be with us always. Amen. Relationship with Christ, membership of his household. Amen. We become sons and daughters of God. Amen. We'll be shown God's mercy and given salvation. Amen. We have a new nature. Amen. Yeah, I might have done, John. Yeah. 
Um, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. God will always love us. Yeah, we're recipients of God's love. Amen. I'll be back down the middle in a moment. Healing and provision. Amen. You're very quiet over here, leadership team. Blessings. <laughs> Blessings. Such as? Well, the everyday things, the fact that you're able to roll out of bed. You know, some people, these things they see as, oh, yeah, it's just one of those things you do. But there are blessings, the fact that we're here, just every normal day things that people might not consider. Yeah, because even, because the Bible says that even the food that we have is actually part of God's blessing for us. So, yeah. Actually hearing from God. Amen. I was going to say conversing with the creator of the whole universe whenever we want to. Isn't that amazing? Open channel to talk to the creator, sustainer of the entire universe. Jesus said, what my father has given me, no man can pluck from my hands. And he said, behold, I am with you always. Yeah, with us all the time. Amen. Okay. You get the hang of this now. We are covered by his blood. Amen. Glorification. We will have a glorified body in the future. Yeah, we've got a new body coming. That's good news, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll be living with God throughout all eternity. Yes, we're on our way to live with God throughout all eternity. Oh, I've just... Uh, hope. Yes, because without God, there is no hope. Okay, I'm going to make this the, the final two for now, because now you've got the hang of this. You're beginning to just... To, Catch a, a bit, so two more. We shall all be changed in a twinkling of an eye. Amen. Amen. And there was a hand at the front here. I, yes. Yeah, because we know God's word, it helps well, me personally to have feeling and compassion for people who is not of my own blood. You understand? Yeah. yeah. And it's a wonderful thing. Fantastic. Isn't that exciting? Yes. And we're only just starting. There's more to come yet. So, verse 7. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles, listen to this phrase, the unsearchable riches of Christ. I'll come back to that phrase in a couple of minutes. Paul received this revelation from God to enable him to proclaim the good news. Not because he was good enough, but because of God's grace. This phrase, less than the least, is um, it's a word play. Because Paul's name in Latin, and that's not from my memory of the time I spent doing Latin that I referred to in my testimony earlier on, but I looked it up in a book. Um, in Paul's name in Latin means least. Paulus actually is Latin for least. So he's making a pun on his own name. I am less than the least, he's saying. Let me, let me read to you something about Paul from 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 12. Thank, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who's given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. So Paul is thanking God here that God actually took him into his service. Listen to the next bit. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. You know, sometimes I uh, meet Christians who think that They've lived such bad lives. 
They've done such wrong things. They have failed so badly that maybe they think God can't use them fully. Do you know, actually it is the reverse that's true. My observation is that it's people actually who are a bit full of themselves, who think that they've never done anything wrong, who think that they are God's gift to the universe, that God has most trouble in using. Just my observation. Because actually their pride and their self-sufficiency get in the way of God using them. Those people who know that actually it is all of God's grace are the people that God can move through and work through most effectively. Amen? Amen. I saw some very strong nods around that congregation, congregation here because I, I obviously know the stories of most of you in the congregation and uh, of lives that you have lived, situations that you've been in, and you know that is God's grace. And because it's God's grace, you know that God can use you. So here is Paul, less than the least. he done all of that, and yet, because of God's grace and God's mercy, God's using him. And using him to talk about the unsearchable riches of Christ. That word unsearchable riches, I came across a guy called Mitten, who'd wrote and wrote and written. Mitten, who'd written. Oh, whatever. In his, in his writing, he said this. This suggests the picture of a reservoir so deep that soundings cannot reach the bottom of it. No limit can therefore be put to its resources now in the context of current lose stories we might want to think about an ocean maybe that is so big and so vast and so deep that it's unsearchable that's the sort of image that's being used here so another question for you the answer's not in the text here, but it's from elsewhere from your reading in Scripture. What are, it's a nice phrase, this unsearchable riches of Christ. But what are some of these unsearchable riches? Riches that you can never get to the bottom of. You can never exhaust. What's he talking about here? Do you think? I'm going to be really careful going past the speaker again. The, the unmerited favor of God on me who was nothing. There's no reason he should favor me. And the complete unconditional love that he pours in my life. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely no limit to that. What else? Um, I think his God's mercy over my life, that me, a wretched man that I am, I'm saved by grace, just, just like Paul. His unmerited favor. Yeah. God's steadfast love and faithfulness and divine blessings and divine peace and divine health. Shall I go on? <laughs> yeah, you can keep going. Want to. It's fine. And the mercy that never ends. It's new every morning. Um, that's profound. Oh, I was going to say God's grace. <laughs> Uh, that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. That's it. Yeah. His power and His glory over us all. Amen. It's basically all the things that we were talking about the first time we answered the question because every single time that you think that you've got to the bottom of understanding those things, something else happens. And it doesn't look... It's like you're looking at it from a slightly different angle and so therefore it doesn't look quite like it did the first time. So even with forgiveness, when you, when you kind of start with it, it means, oh yeah, so it means this. And then you look at it again, a little bit further down the road, and it looks slightly different again. And then you look at it again, it looks slightly different again. It's, it's, like, it's like the William Temple quote, isn't it, about children paddle and elephants swim. It's, it, however deep you go, it, it looks different again. It's one of these... Um Things you can never, I think you can never ever fully understand anything about God. Because yeah. every time you revisit it, yeah. there's more to see. Yeah. God just doesn't fit in our boxes. You know, when, when we try and do uh, theologians, try and box him all up and all the rest of it, I sort of, you know, I just have this image of God sort of being over here saying, oh, I'm over here as well. Oh, and I'm up here and I'm down here and I'm over there. And it just never, ever, whatever system they work out, it never is comprehensive enough. There's always more of God. And eternal life is like that. We, we, you know, we, we talk about eternal life and we've got this phrase that, that I've taught you over the years. It's not original to me. Um, but you know, it begins for us now. But all of the stuff that's wrapped up in that, God's peace, God's presence, security, hope, all of that, it's beyond anything we can ever fathom. It's another word. The idea of the word fathom was actually working out how deep something was. That's the origin of the word. So unfathomable means you can't work out how many fathoms there are, how it's a, which was a measurement, how deep something is. And that's what we're into in terms of our relationship with God. Unsearchable riches. And you know, I think so often we as Christians, we can end up just paddling. Just going back to that phrase that John used earlier on. We can end up just paddling about and think, oh, this is great. This is fantastic. This is wonderful what we have here of God. And it is. But actually, if you go a bit deeper, it's even more wonderful. And when you get in and you're completely out of your depth, your feet are no longer on the bottom. You can't even see the shore anymore. That's when you begin to experience something of the amazingness of what God has for us in this life and beyond. Amen. Amen. Verse 10 and 11. His intent. I have to say this is one of my uh, most, for me, one of the most significant descriptions of the church in the New Testament. So his intent was that through the church... The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. That phrase manifold wisdom, the word manifold there, it, it literally means many coloured or multifaceted. It was a word that was used of uh, complex flowers and a word that was used of tapestry. John Stott wrote this, the church is like a beautiful tapestry. Its members come from a wide range of colorful backgrounds. No other human community resembles it. Its diversity and harmony are unique. Look back at verse 10. It states that the angels and other spiritual beings, which includes those who are hostile to God, only learn of God's wisdom as they watch 
us. Do you just want to read that again, just to make sure I'm not making that up? It says that these spiritual beings, and in that phrase included those who serve God and those that are in opposition to God, only learn of the amazingness of God's wisdom when they look at the church. Brothers and sisters, we have a celestial audience. Which just underlines how amazing what God is doing in the church is. Now this phrase, this tapestry, is a guiding metaphor for us in terms of Greenford Baptist Church here. And directly related to this motto. So let me just talk about a tapestry for a moment. If I'd thought ahead, I would have brought one along, but I didn't, so I haven't. But when you, when you look closely at a tapestry, um, you will, if you look really, really closely, so we're talking like this, okay, closely at a tapestry, you will see lots of individual threads and colours. You won't see a picture. You will see lots of diverse bits of colour. When you step back from the tapestry, the picture begins to emerge. The picture only emerges because of the difference between the threads. So have a look around church here this morning. Yeah, you might need to look behind you as well as in front, you know, on the plane. Your nearest available exit may be behind you. So just have a look around. Yeah, you don't need to look behind you. It's just bricks behind you, okay? You can just look in front. But have a look around. Just have a look at the people who are here. Bit of a mixed bunch, aren't they? Even more of a mixed bunch if you actually knew what their lives were like before they became part of God's family and what their lives are like now as well. Incredibly mixed selection of colours. And I'm using the word colour, not about skin colour, colours in terms of uh, people's lives. And here is the most amazing thing. In God's household, you, each of you, if you're here this morning, can you raise your hand again? Because I want you to know this includes you. Each of you is being woven into an amazing picture that is revealing God's wisdom. And it's so amazing that the spiritual beings are standing on tiptoe watching what God is doing because they have never seen it before. They've never seen this revelation about what God is like. You know, when you, when you look at a work of art, you learn something about the artist. Yeah? You're familiar with that process. Well, you, you are a work of art in progress. Because you are being built together, woven together, stitched together. Now, that's a very intimate image, by the way. You know, it's not some big machine. You know, it's not some great big manufacturing process. But God, through his spirit, is stitching you together with your brothers and sisters into an amazing tapestry, an amazing picture that is revealing something of the manifold wisdom of God. And it's not for your benefit. It actually is to display God's greatness, God's goodness, God's amazingness to everywhere else in the universe. That is what you are a part of by being a part of God's household. Isn't that incredible? So your life, just by being woven into that tapestry, has eternal and cosmic significance. Which is why, and the fact you're here this morning means this doesn't apply to you, but it might apply to some of those who are watching this subsequently. It's why an individual Christian who's not woven into 
a local church context in biblical terms is a bit weird. I got a long letter once from someone who was complaining about the church here. Long, it's about 12 pages if I remember. They were very unhappy with us. Um, and in conversation I, I discovered that they don't go to church ever. Because all, they're Christian, they're serving God apparently, but they never go to church because they can't find the right church to go to. I do find that just a little weird. Because the Bible says, I mean, Grief of Baptist is not a perfect church. I could probably write a longer list of faults of this church than any of you in this congregation. That's because I know more about the church here. It's not perfect. It's a work in progress. God is making a tapestry that actually, as the household of God together, reveals something of his amazing nature. Verse 12. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. We've seen this before. We've mentioned it already this morning. We looked at it last time. We can approach God with confidence and freedom. And that's amazing. I, 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 now I, every time I come to this, it just boggles my mind that me, David Wise, that I can talk to the creator and sustainer of the universe, that he hears me and that he answers my prayer. I, I just can't get my head around that. I know I teach it, I read it, I believe it, but it boggles my mind. And it's true of every believer. Every believer. It's just amazing, isn't it? The creator and sustainer of the universe right now is listening to you. Isn't that just, and not just that, wants the best for you, cares about you, loves you. It's absolutely amazing. Notice here this link between suffering and glory. Frequently come as a pair in the New Testament. And that's because in Jesus' life it was through suffering that he entered his glory, and he is our pattern. Here, as Paul is writing, he is suffering in order to bring glory to God through his proclamation. I find this verse challenging. As I prepared this week, as I stand here this morning, I find this verse challenging. It asks me the question, how committed am I to seeing God's plan for a new community, for his household to become a reality? How committed am I to that? How willing am I to pray? How willing am I to work? How willing am I to suffer, to see that come about. That's the challenge that I take from that verse. And I suggest to you that challenge is there for you as well. So pause. I'm not going to ask you to say this out loud, but I want you to think for a moment about what God may be asking of you as an individual. In terms of seeing his will done, his kingdom come, to seeing 
God's household become all that God wants it to be here in Greenford Baptist Church. Not that we're unique in this. I'm not wanting to claim that we're the only church that's God's household. It's normal Christian stuff. But what is God is asking of you to see that come about, for that tapestry that reveals the manifold wisdom of God? Just think about that for a moment. And I want to invite you, just where you are, privately, for you to respond to God. Because if God has asked you to do something, challenged you about an attitude that needs to change, or something you need to do, this is a good opportunity for responding to him. So let me just give you that, that opportunity now, before I move on. So let me draw things together for this morning. We've been looking in this series, mini-series, of which this is the final part, uh, at our motto for the year, members of God's household. And uh, there are lots of things I could pull out, but there are five things that seem to me to be the key things for us to take away as we respond to God's calling this year for us as a church family. The first thing we saw was that being reconciled with God means being reconciled with other human beings. Reconciliation is at the heart of the gospel. It's about our relationship with God, reconciled with God, but it also means being reconciled with the rest of his family our brothers and sisters. The second thing is to see that we are full citizens in God's kingdom. Citizenship is amazing privilege. But with privilege comes... We are members, thirdly, of God's family. So that means that most of the people in this room here are your family. Have a quick look round. Now you may have noticed that you don't choose your family members. We looked at that last time. You don't choose your family members. You choose your friends and you fall out with them, you can defriend people. But you can't de-family people. And we're not called to like everyone else in our family. but we are called to love them. And loving means wanting the best for them. And of course, that's easier for people that you like. It's more challenging for people that you don't like. But God, through his Holy Spirit, enables us to love other people in our family church family even when we don't like them and finally together we are like a tapestry that shows to the whole cosmos something of what God is like let's stand together shall we if you're able to let me pray for you as we bring this part of our meeting to an end Father God, we thank you for your grace, your amazing grace and mercy. We thank you that it's unfathomable, it's unsearchable. 
your grace, your mercy, your love stretched out towards us, bringing us into relationship with you and keeping us in relationship with you. Father God, thank you. Thank you that our reconciliation with you enables reconciliation with other people. Thank you that we have received full citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. Thank you that we are members of your family, together showing something of what you are like. Father God, help us. Help us today, tomorrow, this week, this month as we work through this year to become more and more the family you created us to be the tapestry that's in progress among us that that demonstrates more and more of your incredibleness to the whole of the cosmos in Jesus name Amen We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.